I had the pleasure to hear our speaker, and he, is, he had been recommended um, by um, some attendees in the past, and I had the pleasure of hearing him in Detroit this um, spring. And I went up to him immediately afterwards and said, hey, I'm going to send you an email because we'd really like to, to have you join us, and we've had requests for you, so I'm so glad that it worked out. Jose Antonio Bowen has won teaching awards at Stanford, Georgetown, Miami, and Southern Methodist University, where he was dean of the Meadows School of the Arts. He was also president of Goucher College and has written over 100 scholarly articles, edited, ed, edited the Cambridge Companion to Conducting, is an editor of Jazz, the Smithsonian Anthology, and he's appeared as a musician with Stan Getz, Bobby McFerrin, and others. He's written a symphony, music for Hubert Laws and Jerry Garcia, and related to us specifically is the author of Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of Your, classroom, your College Classroom Will Improve Student Learning. And that was a winner of the Ness Award for the best book on higher education from the American Association of Colleges and Universities. He's also a founding board member of the National Recording Preservation Board for the Library of Congress and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in England. Stanford honored him as a distinguished alumni scholar in 2010, and he was given the Ernest L. Boyer Award for significant contributions to American higher education from the New American Colleges and Universities in 2018. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bowen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here so early. Thank you, especially those sitting in the front. You can now complain about those students who sit in the back in your classes. Those of you sitting in the back, can't do that. Um, but thank you for being here so early. Um, so I'm not going to talk about teaching naked. Um, and by the way, that's a metaphor. No visual aids today for that. Uh, I will not be doing that. Um, so the good news is uh, you have um, lots and lots of new research. This is, uh, this is all drawn from the new book that I'm, you know, about 60% through. So the bad news is I haven't given this talk before. And so, hey, you never know what you're going to get. Um, but thank you so much for being here. And thank you for what you do. Uh, the work that, we, that you do on our campuses really matters to students. And as you all know, um, from statistics, they're constantly showing us nationally um, that most students don't graduate. Uh, the work you do is absolutely essential um, for our nation and obviously also for our students. Um, so I start here. <laughs> Learning is about change. We are in the change business. Um, that uh, you, can, you can give somebody more information, but if it doesn't uh, change their mind, change their perspective, um, they've, they've not really learned. That's actually the biology of the brain, right? When you, when you're, unless your brain is changing and you're making new neural connections, right, then nothing is, literally nothing has happened. It's just a pass-through, right? Uh, it's like an electrical wire. Um, and so the, the analogy I used to think about this is when my daughter moved to New York and said, Dad, you're going to drive my car for a while. It's like, OK, sure, leave it parked here. Um, so after 40 years of driving, um, I call this a car key, right? And it's a, the cars come with keys, and there's a lock in the car. And so you take the thing out of your pocket, you put it into the, the thing, and it starts, right? So she gives me her new car. And it has this thing, and that button. And I know this sounds hard to believe, but for two years, I took the car key out of my pocket and tried to figure out where to put it. It's like, where does it go? The, the, the car companies have now figured out that for old people like me, they've created a little plastic holder, just a little space, like a cup holder only, and you put the non-car key, and you just rest it there. Because I was throwing it on the seat. It's like, what do I put it? if I put it in the cup holder, I have no place to put my coffee. Where, where do I put this thing? So I am not changing. I've been given some new information, right? A new technology in this case, but I've been given something new. But the problem is it does nothing for me because I'm still thinking in the old way, right? I had to change my perception, my thinking about the thing. It's not a car key. 
It's a personal identity device, a PID. They should have actually called it that because it tells the car who I am. They actually should have made it a wristband, right? Then, then it was like, I get to the car, right? So, so of course it stays in my pocket now. So now I come to the car and the kids are like, Dad, don't. I said, yes, open sesame. Because the car opens when I, get, when I approach. It's amazing. No, it's not really, but I mean, it's still, right? It, but the problem here is that I didn't change, right? You give me this new piece of information, this new, and I still continue to call it a car key, think about it as a car key. I'm not able to take advantage of the new knowledge. It just doesn't work um, because of me, not the thing. So in a sense, change can happen in these two ways. So what I've just given you is the academic version, right? I, I had to change the theory. Right? It was the theory of the car key that was the problem, right? Myself, the, the way I structure the world. In easier language, you have to, have to change perceptions. So these, these are going to be themes today, right? That if you can change students' perceptions or self-belief, then you can, you can change um, their, their attitude and what they will actually do and how they will learn and what happens to them. And, and I've, I've been spending a lot of time in journals um, getting people to quit smoking, to floss more, to vote more, to litter less, um, right? And of course, there, nobody reads those other journals and the other, so I'm learning interesting things about what people don't know about the similar research. Um, but this idea that changing self-perception, um, perception, so that's what I, I had a problem with perception. But there's another way to do this, right? I could have actually just changed my behavior, right? Um, what I call threshold habits. I've, I've become convinced this is one of the keys. Because my daughter, right, was always taught um, by her mother that what, when you're leaving a restaurant late at night or a club, don't leave the car key in your purse. Take it out, and because right, we have we have relatives who are police officers, and so you know, so don't walk up to your car with your handbag and start looking for your car key, because that's when you get mugged. So take it out of your purse at the, in the restaurant, and then walk to your car, and right. So there was a behavior there, right, that we were all doing. We take the car key out, and of course I'm a little obsessive, so I take the car key out before I get right to the car, so I've got it in my hand. Well, that's the problem. It's in my hand before I get to the car. So the habit was the problem. And then now I know what, don't know what to do with this thing, right? So if I can actually just change the habit, you know, hands off, don't touch the key, well, I can also solve the problem. And so it turns out that in a lot of cases, just getting people to the library will help solve the problem, right? You don't have to actually get them on the exercise equipment. Right? If I want you to exercise more, I have to get you to the gym. And it turns out one of the reasons that people don't go to the gym, right? Well, I don't like to sweat. I'm afraid of, I don't know, people will look at me funny. I don't know what to wear. What's the number one reason people don't go to a Broadway show? Right? So this is actual the real research. 90% of a Broadway, if you go to Broadway, 90% of the audience are repeat. Um, visitors. They're not people who've been to that show before necessarily, but they've been to other Broadway shows. And most of the population never go and try them in the arts. And so this is a big question for arts administrators. Why don't people go to, I mean, it's a Broadway show. It's not like it's the opera, right? Number one issue, I don't have anybody to go with. Number two, I don't know what to wear. So you're thinking, that's silly. I, how could it be? Think about this. Think about something that you would never do, right? Think about I want you to go to the monster truck rally. What are your first two questions? Who will go with me? What do I wear? Right, what are the rules? Right? So it's not as silly as it seems. So students don't know the rules about college. Right? And that actually prevents us from doing things. Right? First generation student, right? You can go see a professor in office hours when you haven't done anything wrong? Really? Right? So there are all of these rules. So sometimes just changing the behavior, getting the students to the library is enough. And so we're going to talk a lot about um, these nudges. So, but I'm going, to, I'm going to first take a minute to talk about how students are different. Um, some of this you know, but some of this I think is uh, <clears throat> worth saying again. Uh, right? our, our relationship to knowledge has changed dramatically. Right? When, when, when I went to college and some of you, right, <clears throat> there was this thing called the the encyclopedia, remember that? Right, so knowledge was relatively scarce, but relatively reliable, 
right? If I found the encyclopedia, I could say, oh, I have some confidence that this is real, right? There were no cat videos in the encyclopedia. <laughs> this is very different today. Now you come to college with all of the world's content available in your, in your pocket, but it is mostly cat videos. So the, so, the, so the problem of college and learning has gone from come to college, there's more knowledge here. We will give you content. We are content providers. To you have all the content you will ever need in your pocket. You need to learn process. You need to learn how to figure out which of it is real, which of it is lying, which of it's relevant, which of it is important. So in many ways, our, our shift from content to process, and we still have to teach content. There's still content to learn. But the truth is you can, you can find out what you need to find out if you know how to do it, online, right? And, and so our relationship to knowledge has fundamentally changed, but students are confused. They're so confused, we call this a smartphone, as if it were smart, because the phone knows more than you do. That's not what smart is. Smart is not the person who knows the most. Smart is the ability to change your mind. But students are confused because of the smartphone. Oh, well, it remembers all of my phone numbers. It must be smart. And it's not. So we have to help them realize that learning is a bit like this exercise equipment. More is not always better. It's not just about more content, who knows the most, right? Because your phone does know more than you do, right? But more exercise equipment in your house would probably not help. If I gave you an exercise bike for every room of your house, two in the kitchen, three in the bathroom, am I helping? You've got all the stuff now, but you have to get on it to get the benefit. Right back to my car key. You have to change. You know, just giving you stuff and giving you content doesn't necessarily make any difference. You have to actually change how you use it. You have to get on it. So, so, the, so the fitness turns out to be a great metaphor for learning. It's also biologically very, very similar, right? The person who does the work gets the benefit. So when you're picking a fitness coach, Right? Do you pick the coach who has the biggest muscles? Right? The person, because, because think about it, fitness coaches are a little like faculty. Sorry, as a faculty member, right? They like the gym a little too much. Right? That's why they're still working. It's like, the, it's like yeah, you faculty, we like the library too much. We like school so much. We're still here. That's weird. And it appears weird to other people who don't have this, right? So the same thing you go like fitness coach, like, oh, you work at a gym, you have those, right? You love to exercise. Well, I don't love to exercise. How can you help me? Right? I'm so different than you are, right? So the best fitness coach is not the one who does the best push-ups. It's the one who gets you to do push-ups, the one who understands you. So the first question a good fitness coach asks is, why are you here? What matters to you? And like with all teaching, teaching starts with what matters to your students. It ends with what matters to you. But it's making that connection between, ah, that's what matters to you. This is how chemistry is going to help you. You want to be a paramedic? Pedal faster. That connection is non-trivial. That sense of, I'm going to motivate you to figure out what is the connection, what are the things that you need to do. Right? So watching somebody else do push-ups, not that useful even if they're intellectual push-ups, right? You want the teacher who gets you to do the most homework, who gets you to do the most push-ups. So how you design your assignments, how, that ends up being the real issue. The better designer is the better teacher, the better motivator, right? So I often say to faculty that, that our real type, professing is not what we should mostly do. We are cognitive coaches. We are helping people learn to think for themselves, to get them to do the push-ups, because the one who does the work gets the benefit. And that's true of fitness and biology. It's also true of learning. It's also, frankly, true of what I call the learning economy, right? This new economy we're in, where we don't know what the jobs are going to be, right? Every day there are new statistics. This is a study from Oxford that says, what majors are most likely to be useless? Well, they don't know. It's a predict. They haven't been to the future, as far as I know. But accounting and finance, two of the most popular majors in the country, might end up being done by robots. Well, maybe, maybe not. But we see all of these reports, right? 50% of current jobs um, could be adapted, you know, could be automated, right? The six out of 10, you know, 60% you know, of the jobs that our graduates will do haven't yet been invented, 
right? I have a daughter in New York who's a, a director of social media, right? That's why I have the car in my driveway, right? Because every 27-year-old should be a director. But she directs social media. So when she was in high school, it didn't exist. There was no such thing. And now you can direct it. Well, right? Think about that. So you go to college, and, you, you, and then, well, you're going to direct this, but that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, I know. So, so we don't know what they're going to direct. They will be directors. <laughs> we have no idea what it's going to be because we don't know what those things are going to be. So these jobs are, are being changed all the time. So let's play a little game. Robot, or this is today. I'm talking about today's technology. Right now, today, not the future, right? <laughs> Those lawyers are a pretty safe job, right? You'd have to be a human being. You couldn't have robots to do that, right? Anybody think that's right? Yeah, okay, actually, we've already got a robot lawyer um, who's, who's mostly arguing parking fines, but that's, you know, that's okay. Um, I'm a musician, right? So surely music composer will always be done by human beings, right? Yeah, so you've already heard AI composed music in films and TVs where they say, you know, I want some scary music, and the computer writes the music. How about journalists? Yes, you've also read um, artificial intelligence sports stories that are already published in the Washington Post, written by robots, right? They literally watch the World Series, right? Look, look at the score, and then write the report that's printed in the paper, already. But luckily, right, for someone who likes whiskey, how could we possibly have a whiskey taster? That's a robot, right? No, so we're safe with a whiskey taster, I'm sure. Oh, wait! No, there actually is already a robotic tongue that is way, way, way more accurate than human beings. And it's, it was designed, you love this, right? It was designed to determine which whiskey are fake. Because people will take the bottle and they'll like, you know, put brown water in there. Or they'll put some cheaper whiskey in there and the human beings can't taste it. But the robot can, so thank goodness we have robot whiskey tasters. Um, so if you were thinking about any of those jobs for your graduates, of course I have a lot of undergraduates who want to be the whiskey taster. Sorry, but what we do know is that employers do value the skills that we really f say we focus on, right? Problem solving in groups of people who are not like us, critical thinking, teamwork, right? That study after study shows that these skills do matter. So I point out that all of these skills go beyond the classroom, right? This is not something you can only learn in chemistry or accounting, right? Problem solving, everybody who works in res life knows that we are in the problem solving business. Right? So it turns out that if we really want to help students acquire these skills, everything that happens on our campus matters. And in fact, the connections matter because one of the things that students are not very good at, right, is making those, is integrating the various things that happens on the campus. They're not even good at integrating what happens in two different classes in the morning and the afternoon. I ran a study at, at Miami University where one of the four pillars of the Miami plan is critical thinking. And it turns out, that students were not getting it. We teach critical thinking in all these courses and we have all of these required core courses. And so we tried an experiment. We said, okay, you have to keep doing what you're doing in your classrooms. And you have, just use those words, critical thinking. Just draw a, a box around it. Every time you do it, say, that was critical thinking. And I know it sounds dumb, but just try it. Turns out it made a huge difference. Just labeling, wait, my, my physics professor said that this morning. I'm in political science now. You're, you're telling me that there's critical thinking in both? No! So if you tell me there's critical thinking in res life, in student government, right, students will actually start to make the connection that the skills they're learning are transferable and they'll be able to talk about it in their interview and where they learned it because the employer doesn't care if they learned about critical thinking or problem solving or teamwork on their athletic team or in biology class. And in fact, if they can connect those dots, all the better. So integration is another theme of today. So in the learning economy, what students can learn will be way more important than what they have learned, right? Because what, what they need to know for the jobs of the future, you can't teach them. We don't know what it is yet. We have no idea what the social media of the future is going to be. So we need to prepare students for the unknown. We need to prepare them to be able to be self-regulated learners. We want to graduate, right? In a sense, teaching is about making yourself obsolete, right? I was a piano teacher, right? And so I don't want you to have to come back to me forever. I mean, in some ways, my ego would feel good. But at the end of the day, I want you to know if that piece is ready to be played in public or not. 
It's like, so I would ask students, do you think that's ready for public performance? Because sometimes the answer is yes, you've been practicing way too long, just go do it now. And other times the answer is no. But if you need me to tell you that, you are not ready to graduate. And when I've made myself obsolete, and you can make those decisions for yourself, you're self-regulated, now you're ready, right? So I often think of the, the, the curriculum really as a toolbox, right? It's not about the stuff that we build, it's about the tools that we give you. Because you don't know if you're gonna need a hammer or a screwdriver. And a major is like one tool, right? Your physics major is great, but it's a hammer. And when my mother calls and says, you know, will you come and fix something? I don't know if I need a hammer or a screwdriver. So I bring the whole box. But if I only have a hammer, because I was a great physics major, you didn't take any psychology courses? No. Then I, don't, I, I can't solve, right? So, so this collection of tools is really important, and the integration of those things is really important. So I call this the new three R's. I think our emphasis now needs to be on, remember the old three R's? Those were content-focused, reading, writing, arithmetic. Content that you couldn't get anywhere else. Now that you can get content easily, we need to focus more on process so you understand which content is, is, is true, which content is accurate, which content is relevant for today. And, and that's really how our job has changed um, on, on college campuses, especially as people are looking at our value proposition going, well, why should I pay you for content I can get on the internet? And the, t the chance is that they're true, they're, that's right, it's true. If all you're offering are physics courses and psychology courses, Go to, go to edX, go to Coursera. Stanford and Harvard are giving those away for free. If all you're offering is a credential, well, that's not going to last very long because they're free credentials. When I was at Goucher, the Johns Hopkins started offering a $400 uh, master's degree in data analytics. $400! It was really a $400 test. right? You take the courses online, you come here and take the test, you pass the test, we certify you. right? But that's $400, right? You can't pay the bills on that, right? They definitely put us out of business in our master's degree, right, with face-to-face. -face. And unless we can do something that they, you don't just get from doing it online, you've got to have something better. So the future belongs to either people who are the best at what they do or who are better aggregators, better integrators. So the campuses that survive will be campuses that are better integrators of the various pieces that say, the sum is more than the, than the parts. What you get on this campus is more than just courses and student fairs and support, right? You become self-regulated. We will change you. But we use a lot of that rhetoric, but we don't really mean it. We don't really do it. We still say, well, there's a take 120 credits. We're going to measure butt time. Yeah, you're giving the degree to the wrong part of the body. Really, all you've measured is how long you sat on your tuchus. So, okay, so technology changes our relationship to knowledge, but it also has changed, right, social proximity, the meaning of friends, you all know this, you know social media, but, but this is much more profound than this, they spend all their time on their phones. They're having less sex, right? They're calling this the sexual recession. <laughs> and it's worse in countries with greater technology. Think robots again. I'm not kidding. I'm going back to Japan in a couple of weeks where the problem is the worst. And it's partly because, right, if you can get what you need in a dark room with a TV screen, why should I go out? It's so threatening out there. I mean, this is a pretty profound change, right? I mean, think about Steve Jobs in kindergarten, right? What do you want to do, Stevie, when you grow up? I'm going to invent a device so powerful that teenagers will have less sex. And he did it. He did it. That's amazing in the history of, of, of humanity. Right? A little dopamine dispenser that you could give to people, and they would become addicted to it, and they, so addicted they would have less sex. Right? So they're also driving less. They're more likely to feel lonely. Right? These trends are significant. They're getting less sleep. Right? And we'll talk about sleep a little bit later. So this is really a significant change. Um, they're on their cell phones all the time. They do, like, the first thing they touch when they wake up, the last thing they touch before they go to sleep. That's part of why they're not having as much sex, right? Um, <laughs> but if you remember nothing else from today, right? This, this, the third line down, right? People ask me, what's the strangest thing I learned as a college president? I said, well, that, that most students cannot use the toilet without a phone. 
and, and, and we know this because there's a job on most, on your campuses, it's probably a job, because somebody has to do this. They have to get the phone back out of the toilet. Because students drop their phones in the toilet all the time. So it's a job, it's like, oh yeah, call Bob. He'll get your phone back. But that's not the strangest thing I learned. The strangest thing is, they want it back! <laughs> right, that little bag of rice you put, right? So when you see a student with their phone in a bag of rice, right, that's been in the toilet. So if you remember nothing else from today, never borrow a student's phone. <laughs> Probably enough said about that. Let's just say the world has changed. So right, when you think about office hours, <laughs> Remember that, right? The idea that I have to go to a physical place, right? My bank is open 24 seven. What do you mean you don't have online support? What do you mean I can't just text the professor on Sunday afternoon? So I'm a big fan, right? Doctors all do this, right? My, all of your doctors now have 24 seven portals, um, right? They often have chat, they often have support, um, right? Every, if, you, if you've not used the e-doctor or the phone, right? There's most of our insurance companies, you may not have seen this yet, but you probably already had this option where instead of going to the doctor, you can just make a phone call and you talk to a doctor on the phone on Sunday night. Well, that's pretty convenient. But if you've grown up in a world like that, right? The bank, right? Think about your phone, right? I don't, I don't, I don't go to the bank. I bank on my phone. And if the bank website is closed or down at Sunday at 11 p.m., I'm pissed! I was going to do banking now! So those students now show up on your campuses it's like, what do you mean I have to show up at Tuesday at 9.30 for office hours? That's weird. It is weird. So I'm a big fan of sharing support. You should have Sunday afternoon and nighttime support, and the faculty can do what doctors do. Somebody's on call. Right? Somebody's in the chat. It doesn't have to be you every day. You can't be. You've got other things to do. But somebody should be available Sunday night because that's when students actually do homework. Right? So where are the support services lined up at the right time when students actually use them and in the mode, which is online, that they use them? Some of this is also from this third problem, which is customization and gaming has changed the world. Your students are arriving on college camps. They have been now for 10 years, having played more hours of video games more time in front of a screen playing video games than they have in school, even if they had perfect attendance, right? 10,000 hours is the average number of hours they've spent playing video games as a, as a college freshman, right? That's that, that's that 10,000 hours of expert number, right? They're experts at that. But what they've learned is something interesting because the, the, the game designers figured out that what really matters is that games are pleasantly frustrating. That's the zone, because what happens if a game is too easy? You quit. What happens if it's too hard? That's true of learning, too. Right, if I'm trying to learn tennis or yoga or physics, if it's too easy, I quit. If it's too hard, right? So games are designed to be pleasantly frustrating for everybody at the same time. So if it's too easy for you, it gets harder. If it's too hard for you, it gets easier. So you can be at level five, you're at level 50, you're at level 5,000, but you're all playing at the same time. And the game is customized to make it pleasantly frustrating for each of you. So you're engaged, right? The magic word, engagement. Video games are great at engagement. In fact, they, look at, they, call, they call this the trinity, right? Urgency, focus, and optimism, right? This is called the epic win face, right? Look at the face, right? If our students looked like this all the time, we'd have no problem. Right? So engagement precedes learning. If we can get them engaged like this, then the rest is easy. So the problem is that video games have, have acculturated them to getting everything customized for them all the time so it's at exactly the right level of pleasantly frustrating. And then they come into our classrooms and it's like, wait, say that again. My clicker, my phone's not working. Stop! He's still talking. Why is he still talking, right? It's, I, it's like I teach to the middle. That's the only thing anybody can do in front of a big room, right? We're face to face. I can't go faster for you and slower for you. But on YouTube, you can, which is one of the reasons that students like, you know, uh, video cast lectures, which I'm not a fan of, because if you're going to do that, why stand up here and drone, all right? But what they do, when it turns out that the, the viewing patterns are they don't watch like you and I would watch. 
No 20-year-old does that. No 25-year-old does that. It's like, let's go fast, right? Because there's all those little buttons. I can do it twice as fast. I can slow it down. I can watch that part again. I can skip that bit. I can personalize this. So they live in a personalized world. That's also a gaming world, right? Some of you, right, you just heard earlier, right? If you go, you, there are prizes if you fill out your card. It's a wrap, right? There are incentives. <clears throat> we like getting points, right? Oh, I don't want to stay at this hotel. I don't get points here. That's gamification. It works in our rest of our lives. Students are used to it. Why not try it in school, right? Um, there's actually professors who've stopped using them, the dreaded midterm final exam words, right? Welcome to my class. There'll be six quests in my class. There's a final quest and a mid quest and an optional quest, right? I mean, language does matter, and, and what, because the excitement about, ooh, our quests, I like quests. <clears throat> I'll take one, and again, if I can design a situation where you will do more of my quests, then over here where you, your homework is less, right, then, then you're gonna learn more, and so, <clears throat> you know, why, why does that matter? Okay, so learning is about change, <clears throat> but change is, is mediated through sweet. What matters most for student learning is sleep, water, exercise, eating, and time. Notice that teaching is not the T. I really wanted teaching, the T to be for teaching. But it turns out time on task matters more, right? So if you spend you know, two hours a day learning Japanese and you only spend 15 minutes, guess who learns more Japanese? Whatever the teacher, right? So, <clears throat> The way I design my homework matters because if you're teaching algebra and you're still using those problems about the trains, you remember, train A leaves the station going 20 miles an hour. Train B leaves the station 10 minutes later going 30 miles an hour. <sighs> Nobody cares unless you want to be a train scheduler when you grow up. <laughs> so the motivation to do that problem is zero. So if you're still assigning those problems, and then the football team is over here in my class, I'm going, hey, okay, we're going to learn some problems today. So the wide receiver you're covering can run 30 miles an hour. You can only run 20 miles an hour. How far back do you have to stand so he doesn't score a touchdown? That's the same problem, right? I mean, it's exactly the same math, isn't it? But who's going to spend more time on which problem set? Trains? Right? So, so I might need multiple problem sets. So you're not interested in football? So here's a different problem set about you know, fashion and sizes or about um, you know, gardening or about food, right? Whatever. I have, if I have four or five different options, because the word problems, right, it's the motivation, right? So the math could be the same. But designing problems that students want to do, just like your fitness coach who figures out, oh, oh really, this is what right, the, that connection matters. So the object is to get them time, and teaching does matter for that. But for, the, for what we do for student success, getting students in the library, getting them to study more, is really what matters. And that's not just about the design of the problem sets. It's about, can we get you into the library? Can I get you better habits? So, and we're going to come back and talk about those threshold habits. Um, but what, what they eat, exercise, it turns out that 40 minutes after you, if you, exer if you study chemistry, and then four hours later you do mild exercise, you remember more the next day, right? Water turns out to really matter. All of you caffeine drinkers in the morning, you will remember less tomorrow. <laughs> Those of you who started with water today will remember more. Those of you who don't care about remembering, drink up. Right? So, but if you want to improve your students' test scores, or, right, because it, it is, it's a memory function, right, more water in the morning, and so putting water on, you know, water, you know, bottled water or whatever on the tables before the test will increase their ability to remember, right? So, so, so the, what, what you do in the dining hall, and I'll come back to, and those sorts of things matter, but sleep is the biggest one. Sleep is absolutely the most important one. And of course, the sleep needs of your students are, ch are changing. So as you get older, you need more sleep until about 20, 21, and then it gets, you start to, your circadian rhythms change. So the, the height of circadian change, right, because teenagers are time shifted later, right? So as you get older from about 13 to 14 on, um, you, you start to want to go to sleep later, 
than your parents and your little brother. This is biology, right? So those of you who remember your biology, remember everything has to have an evolutionary reproductive reason. So think, what is the reproductive value of going to bed later as a teenager? <laughs> remember that, that until the 19th century, most of us slept with our parents and their cous our cousins and aunts and uncles, right? So if you're awake when they're awake, you're gonna reproduce less. So teenagers are biologically designed to, to fall asleep later and to wake up later. And the peak of that is, is later for boys than for girls. So for boys, it's 20 years and six months, and for girls, it's 19 years and eight months. Right? So, so girls start to get better at the morning before the boys do, on, on average. Right? There's lots and lots of evidence, by the way, that when you start high school later, that good things happen. Students do better, first period, et cetera, et cetera. My favorite statistic that you'll never find unless you read like weird journals, when you shift high school start time from 7.30 to 8.30, not only do the students do better, there are fewer traffic fatalities in those counties. Because teenagers are already not very good at decision making. When they're sleepy, they're much worse. And they kill people, literally, right? So remember, we get them three months later. And, as, and I said that, right, as especially the boys, until they're 19 or 20, they're still shifted. They, and again, in fact, they're getting worse. They're worse as college freshmen, right? They want to go to bed later, and they want to sleep later on the weekends. Both of those things are biology, right? As college freshmen, than they did in high school. So if you're putting gateway courses at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's a disaster. Your freshman courses to start at 11, and if you really want to help students, don't ever put calculus or econ 101 at 9 or 10. More world records are broken in the, late after, in the, in the early afternoon than they are in the morning. If you have the 9 o'clock heat, you're not going to break the world record. Because performance increases later in the day, right? And remember, most athletes are still younger. They're, they're past that age of 20, many of them, right? So performance changes during the day. So I'm a big fan, and seniors, First of all, their circadian rhythms are shifted back. They can take a nine, they're, they're more likely to take a nine o'clock class and do well. But they've also been in school for three years. They've learned the rules. And they're about to start those jobs that we see. Well, we gotta train them for getting up at nine in the morning. Okay, do that as a senior, not as a freshman. But the schedule, especially for your gateway courses, if a student has failed a course, when should, what should happen when they retake the course? In my view, they should get priority for the 11 o'clock class. They shouldn't have to register by, by alphabet or whatever. You failed that course, I want you to pass it the next time, you're much more likely. Pass rates are higher at 11 or 1 o'clock than they are at 8 or 9. So why are you putting them back in the 9 o'clock class? So sleep matters. Turns out that 7 hours of sleep <coughs> changes what you remember. In the 8th hour of sleep is when you get 90% of your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep. And that means that you de-emotionalize your memories, right? Your REM sleep is when you relive the day, but you relive the day's events with your adrenaline response turned off. So you can't actually get scared and run around. So you de-emotionalize memories. So if I get eight hours of sleep, I remember that I learned something about calculus in my math class. I remember the math. Because I've, I've put those memories from the hippocampus into the neocortex in the eighth hour. With, I figured out where to put them. Right? The first seven hours of sleep is just that preparing the data symbol on your phone. Right? Preparing the data, making sure everything's in the right format. In the eighth hour is when you actually download stuff and take it out of the random access memory, which is what your hippocampus is. Right? So if you get eight hours of sleep, you remember the math. What happens if a student gets seven hours of sleep? They remember how they felt in math class. That's all I remember. I felt stupid. I felt scared. Math? What do we do? And that's just biology, right? So the m improving teaching is nice, but the most important thing is getting them to get more sleep. Your memories will change as you get more sleep. So when you have classes, so I'm a big fan of, of LED lighting, not these, right? Um, because the blue light at night is keeping you up. So how many of you have a blue light filter on your phone or your machine, right? You know to turn the blue light off, nightshade, I, they all have them. If you don't, you should do that. And first of all, the other thing you should do is make your students do it, right? I saw in somebody, at a, you know, have them take a picture of their screen settings and prove to you they have their nightshade on. But if, but if you have a new, relatively new dorm in the last five years, talk to your people about the LED lighting. You can change the color, the temperature of the light at night. 
right? So I made the lights, all the blue light of the dorm go out at 10 o'clock at night. It also reminds you, oh, it's a, it's a cue that it's nighttime. Sleep might be good, right? So what you remember changes. Um, <clears throat> If you get seven hours of sleep, well, if you get eight hours of sleep a night, actually, for some, it's nine. It's a great experiment. I show students, I didn't, uh, Alan Walker at Berkeley did, showed students 36 faces. Some are angry, some are happy, some are sad. So if you get eight hours or nine hours of sleep, you can identify that person is happy, that person is sad, that person is a threat, etc. You get 35 out of 36 right. What happens if, if, I, if I cut off you, if I wake you up after seven hours? or six and a half, it goes to zero, one or zero. You virtually cannot tell the difference between happy, sad, and you want to kill me! So think about the biology. What's the default? You didn't get enough sleep. You got woken up in the middle of the night. Should the default be, everybody loves me? Or is the better default for biology, everybody's a threat? So your biology says everybody's a threat. So you didn't get enough sleep. Everybody's a threat. So you go into class, what happens? You want to, you hate me. Right? Your, your anxiety is higher. Your ability to deal with emotions is lower. And your ability to recognize when somebody wants to help you goes almost to zero. So you're trying to help me. The problem is that I can't recognize you're trying to help me because they didn't get enough sleep. So sleep is a, ma my new article is called Sleep is Pedagogy. Sleep is a major problem on our campuses. And so thinking about the systems that we can do, uh, you know, with, with, with dorms and lights, meal times, right? Don't serve meal late at night. What's the worst thing you can do for sleep? Pizza and beer study break at 10 or 11 o'clock, right? Because it turns out you should actually eat all of your calories when the sun is shining. Your body was designed to eat during the day. It's hard to find berries at night, right? So when you put food into your body after sundown, it disrupt, disrupts your sleep cycle and the quality of your sleep. So make them eat earlier. I know some of those things are hard, but they do pay dividends. Um, and finally, I mentioned about performance. My favorite study on this is the Stanford basketball team. Um, they increased the amount of sleep that both the men's and the women's varsity team were getting. They just added an extra hour of sleep to the routine. They increased the free throw percentage by 9%. They didn't practice more, they slept more. That's a massive increase, that's game winning, right? So sleep really matters. So when you do things matter, sleep matters, so sleep is, is a big thing. Okay, so I know I wanna talk about nudges. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of, of types of practical tips. So remember I said we could try to change people's perceptions, we're about change, but we can also try to change their behavior. So a nudge, in the, so this is from The Economist, right? So psychologists have been doing this for 100 years, but, but, the, but the people who try to sell you stuff just figured this out, right? Um, and they figured, actually, the marketing people didn't have a theory. They just knew that people bought more stuff at eye level, right? So if you're a, a theoretical econ, if, if you're right in the economic models, you buy the cheapest product, not what's at, near the register. So economists have figured out that, in fact, human behavior is not exactly like we predicted. We're not entirely rational all the time, right? So a nudge allows you choice. It doesn't determine what you have to do, an ideal nudge, right? But it, but it helps you make better decisions because it gives you some incentive or changes the, the, the relationship between the decisions, right? So it is important that I think, I, I, I'm going to talk about changing the default, et cetera, but students still have the choice of changing those things. So the ideal nudge is this fly in the toilet. So those of you who know men know that we sometimes have trouble with aim. And the issue is cognitive load, right? You've heard about this, right? Students have it, right? It's because when you're thinking about, some, right, you, you have only so much bandwidth, just like Wi-Fi. Your brain only has so much bandwidth. And if you're thinking about physics really deeply, you just forget to aim. But the fly is, gets you to pay attention. And I want you to think about those two words. Pay attention. What's the first word? It costs something, right? There's a price to be paid for attention, right? We can't pay attention to everything, which is why we have system one, system two. We have different, we have a fast automatic system and we have a slow rational thinking system. But sometimes we don't have time to do everything. In fact, we, the, the, the biologists tell us that if we did, if we used our system two, our rational thinking process for everything, we would need brains and heads the size of a refrigerator, right? Our bio, we, 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 we wouldn't have heads big enough to stay on this body. So what our, what, our, what our brain did was realize we don't have to think about everything deeply. 
We don't have to pay attention to everything. So getting students to pay attention means they don't pay attention to something else, right? There's limited bandwidth and cognitive load. So it turns out the fly is just enough of a nudge, right? You don't have to, right? You can ignore the fly. It's not forcing you to do anything. But it does mean that we use 80% fewer chemicals in the world. That's a good thing. And it's really a good thing if you're a janitor. But it's a good thing for everybody. So, so know that nobody hurts. It doesn't cost anything. And it does improve men's aim in the bathroom. So that's a nudge. So I'm going to talk about other kinds of nudges that we can use on our campus. So in 1932, a psychologist named Charles Hull was doing experiments with rats in a maze. So not on human beings, on rats, right? Not even mammals, rats. And he discovered that rats ran faster as they got closer to the goal. That at the beginning of the maze, it's like, I don't know what I want. Where am I going to go? It's like, but it's like, wow, I'm almost there. They run three times as fast once they get toward the goal. So he called this the goal gradient hypothesis because he was only studying rats. Turns out right, that, you know, 90 years later, um, this is true of most mammals. It's true of humans. So, of course, the marketers already knew this because this experiment, this is a Columbia University student experiment, coffee shop, right? Buy 10, get one free. Here's your card, right? You've seen these, right? You get 10 stamps, you get one free. How about buy 12, get one free, but you get two bonus stamps. Now, to a system two thinker and a, a theoretic, those are the same, right? They're exactly the same. You have to buy 10 cups of coffee to get one free. Under which scheme do people buy more coffee? They buy more coffee under the second one. So the closer you are to a goal, the more likely you are to pursue it and pursue it faster. So I have a new nudge grading system. Everybody starts at 50. Make everything worth half as much, you're halfway there already. Right? We know students are going to work harder. So what are the things on your campus where you want students to achieve the goal? How can I get you to start closer? And right, this is kind of dumb in a sense, right? It's just, it's just giving you two bonus stamps and getting you free. But it turns out that the, fat, the closer you are to the goal, uh, the, the, the harder you work to get that. It also turns out that we get choice overload from too many choices. So this is the famous jam experiment. It works with chocolate or courses, too. But if you have, so one table was set up at, at Drager's in California, right, which is a fancy boutique. So they have all, like, 24, 30 types of jam. Um, and so they had a table set up with only six types. Would you like to try some jam? Then they would change it every two hours. And now this, would you like to try some jam? I have, I have 30 different types of jam to try. People stop at the table with 30 types of jam. They have more, they spend longer, they taste more, right? They buy less. It's, too, um, it's like choice, it's choice overload from too many choices. It turns out that making choices is depleting. This is why um, it's, it's recommended that you make the dumb decisions the night before. Pick out your clothes the night before. Because that, if you pick out your clothes in the morning, you've made choices, and you now have, you're now less capable emotionally later in the day. That's why Barack Obama right, only had blue suits in his closet. Right? It's also why grocery shopping is irritating. Right? This has been proven. After you go grocery shopping, think about it, grocery shopping, lots of choices, right? Because there's like 75 types of everything. So when you get home after you've gone grocery shopping, right, you're, you're, you're less good to the kids. You're, you, you have less cognitive ability. You are cognitively depleted. So what's the first thing we do in college? Right? So, so if I want you to, to buy more, I give you fewer choices. It's easier to make a choice. So if you have too many choices, you defer the choice or you just don't make it at all. You procrastinate. Or you make the decision and now you're irritable. Your anxiety has gone up. So what's the first thing we do in college? Hi, welcome to college. Here are 5,000 courses, pick five. That's terrible. First of all, um, right, you probably can't pick the right courses. And second of all, if you do, you're depleted. So there's actually an experiment where students were asked, so you, we'd like you to just make a list of 10 or 12 courses that look interesting to you. And then we're going to have you do some homework. You, I'd like you to pick the five courses you're going to take next semester, and then we'll do some homework. Guess who spends more time doing homework? These students suffered no cognitive depletion. Just Put, picking courses that you like on a piece of paper didn't cause any depletion. Having to pick your courses, meant you, you studied half as, you were just like, oh, I'm so beat, because you make choices. 
So at Goucher, we tried a new system. We said, look, tell us, answer us a couple of questions. Do you want to be pre-med? Number two, are you sure? That's all you have to ask. No, I'm kidding um, about the second question. But you like, I know from your forms that you fill that, that you want to be pre-med, you are a pre-pharmacy student, you're, you, know, you have interest, you hate English, you're, you're nervous about math, you, whatever, right? Here's a schedule, here's the default schedule. It's already filled out. You can change anything you like. So you're not bound by this, you can change things. But think about the difference between having a blank registration. Oh my God, I've got to pick five courses, what are they gonna be in? You have a schedule, it's set up for you. You can change it, but you can't, you didn't. So you could still take five art courses, and you know they do. <laughs> I like art. It's like, no, take English. You know what the first semester is going to be like. 70% of students took the default, because you'll see in a minute the defaults, right? We're, we have a status quo bias, right? So, so defaults matter. So give them the right default before they arrive on your campus. Let them change. or. Say, bring a list of the 10 courses that look interesting to a meeting, and we'll go over this. But don't make them register for courses on their own. They're, a, they don't do it very well. We know that. But B, even if they do do it, right, they're depleted for the things. But we just, the, all of the evidence about this is that choice, too many choices is bad. Um, it's, it's even true of chocolate. I was really disappointed to find this out, that when you give someone 30 choices of chocolate, and I give you five choices of chocolate, Right? The people with 30 choices take a lot long. They take eight times as long. And once they, you could have one of these for free, what happens? They're less happy with their decision. Oh, because the other 29 flavors looked really good. I only give you five choices, you're much happier with your decision. Isn't that weird? Yeah, psychology's fun. Social norms. So we know that these work. So there's been a ten, we've now had 10 years. Some of you probably get electricity bills like this. But we've now known for, for this is a 10 year experiment. That if you get an electricity bill that says, right, look in the yellow, last month you used more electricity than your neighbors, ouch, what happens? People not use less, less electricity. And you know what's interesting? They do hard stuff. Just this, this costs nothing. Just knowing that you're using more electricity than your neighbors, is like, well, I, but I want to be, I, I believe in the environment. I didn't know that. People will do things, literally, they did a phone call survey to, to verify these results. Well, what did you do to save? Because they discovered that people used less electricity. Well, what did you do? Oh, I washed dishes by hand. I didn't use my dishwasher. I slept without air conditioning. What? <laughs> my wife is never doing that. I mean, that's hard. That is a real behavior change just from that one line, right? Well, not just from that one line. The other things about this experiment were that you got... In the last 12 months, right, your neighbors saved $430 extra per year. And then on the back of the form, it tells you, here are some action steps. Here are some things you can do to save electricity. Unplug your computer at night. It doesn't need to be charged. It's already at 100% charge. Unplug your computer at night actually will save electricity. I didn't know that. That's easy. I can do that. So then they, they refine this experiment because you'll, you'll note, right, half of the people are not going to get this message. So now they said, well, look, the, the most efficient neighbors, right, the, the top 10%, or right, that little green bar, your top 10%, so 90% of people will now get this message, you're not in the A group. You're not the most, and, and this is based upon people with similar square footage houses if you read the fight print. So I have an idea for grading, for, for, stuff, for studying, right? So the A students are studying two hours a week more than you are. I think that's, I mean, I'll come back to that. I'm, talking, I'm starting a big, a big project at the moment on trying to get students to study more without having to spend any money. But social norms work. Turns out the messages, people pay more attention to negative messages. Um, if, if you tell people, nobody pays their tax, 11 million people last year didn't pay their taxes. People don't vote. Millions of people didn't vote. What happens? Oh, nobody votes. Why should I? How come they're paying? I'm paying taxes. Why should I do that, right? You actually, those messages decrease people's desire to pay taxes, give blood, whatever, right? So negative messages about, because if the social, if people know, well, that's not really, you know, true, what you're telling me to do, or the opposite, hey, I can, I can now get away with this. So the way that you craft them, there's a whole literature on how we craft these messages, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that. But this is my favorite. It turns out 
that if you're in the top, right, so, you, so if you get, you're using too much electricity, you reduce electricity. But what happens if the message says, you're using less electricity than your neighbors? What happens? Well, they're getting away with something. I should use more. So, so some people actually start to use more electricity because they got the message, you use less electricity than your neighbors. And that's called the boomerang effect. Guess what totally eliminates the boomerang effect? A smiley face. I couldn't make this shit up. <laughs> right? If you get an energy bill that says you use less energy than your neighbors, you're likely to use more energy next month. You get a bill that says you use less energy than your, than your neighbors, I neutralize the effect. So those kids and their emojis, they were on to something. <laughs> Right? Who would have thought that emojis were the answer to student success? So if, if you get, you're studying, you just studied a lot this week. That's fantastic. Keep going, right? You're on a streak. Smiley face. Right? Because I got to remind you that this is, this is a good social norm. Yeah, I know. Who thought? So one of the things about notice is that we often think, right, we're in the education business. So what do we think? We think education works. Too many people are smoking. Education campaign, right? People aren't exercising. Education. People are eating too many carbs. Education. Food pyramid will help. No, it didn't. Food pyramid didn't help. Information is not enough. So a study at Yale found that you could convince 98% of seniors that they needed to get a tetanus shot. We have, they, have, they brought them into a room and said, hey, tetanus, it's bad. Get a shot. Oh, okay. Got to get a tetanus shot. How many people actually show up for the tetanus shot? Three, you know this, right? This is our lives, <laughs> right? We give them information. They say, oh, oh, yeah, I'll go to my advising appointment. Yeah, oh, that matters, yeah. No. So it turns out that there's a way to change that dynamic. It turns out if I say, if I do the same experiment, but now I say, when can you go get a, t take out your diary. This is before cell phones. Take out your diary. When can you go? Or now I would say, take out your cell phone and tell me when you can go. Turns out this is true for voting. This is true for all sorts of things. So if you call people and say, are you, are you to vote tomorrow? That actually increases voting. Oh, because once you, oh, I'm voting it tomorrow, I should vote. How will you get to the st polling station? Tell me how you plan to vote tomorrow. That has this, this, right, this is incredible. It's a ninefold increase. And people show up and get a tetanus shot. Nobody wants a tetanus shot, it hurts. But by making you think about so, right, this is called the implementation gap sometimes, right, that you want to do something, but, you, but if I actually make you go through in your brain, how am I going to vote, how am I going to study, when am I going to go to the library, when am I going to go to my advisor, I'm, right, eight or nine times more likely to go. Now, you can see down at the bottom, I'll put this online, but you can see the, uh, the references for these weird studies and the weird journals are there, right, so... Um, so this is another one, right? So we do surveys all the time. We want them to, we want them to opt in to email, right? No, you want them to opt out, right? So organ donation, right? The, what country in the world has the highest percentage of organ donors? That would be Spain. They have an opt-out program. So everybody in Spain is automatically an organ donor unless you tell them, I don't want to be an organ donor. Duh, they have, right? In, in America, it's the opposite, right? You have to say, I'm going to put on my driver's license. I want to be an organ So most people are not. So the opt-in, the opt-out, the default. But the frame also matters. It turns out that we pay more attention to negatives, right? But if you switch the default, so look at these, right? This was a, right, do you want to know about, do you want to get notifications about financial aid? The initial study was about, you know, do you want to get more health surveys? Yo, I'd love that. Um, right, but look at the, right, these, these are grouped by the same outcome, right? So number one, do not not notify me about financial aid deadlines, but the default is no, notify me about, but the, de right, the default is which box is already checked, right? So what, do you think these, the, the answers are all the same? What percentage of people go along and get more financial aid notifications? Is it all the same? No, it's not. It's actually wildly different. So the best way to get people to, to get your financial aid deadlines is to say, please notify me about financial aid deadlines on the form and pre-check the box yes. They can uncheck it, right? You can go on the, you can, right? You've, you've seen this, right? Every time you get an app and it says, notifications are automatically turned on, you can turn them off in settings. That's because those people know how to get you to do this, right? We need to use all those same tricks. 
right? So how you set the default, how you frame, this really does matter. Dramatically different effects based upon how you ask the question and what the default is. Um, all right, so kind of a summary of these, of these things. So ultimately what we're trying to do is help students make better choices on their own. Right, so I'm just going to give you a list uh, with a couple of examples for each. So I talked about choice overload. Uh, one of the places I would suggest you do this is class. But how about clubs, right? Not instead, instead of join a couple of clubs, we have a big club fair with 5,000 different clubs. How about, you know, I read your application. You applied to the campus. I've, I've enrolled you in the intramural soccer club. You cannot go. But here's when the meeting is, right? So I think, you know, figuring out when they need to make choices. Turns out that right, the, the orientation is a terrible time to give students information. Nobody cares. All they want to know is, do I look cool in this? Right? Is she looking at me? Right? So orientation, their emotions are going berserk. So stop with the information, please. Let them make friends. So your orientation about the career center. No one's going to remember that. It's two seconds later. So at Goucher, we built a career program. So every semester before you register, you've got to go do something. Or every semester, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a mark you have to make. Because I don't want to know about jobs. I just got here. I'm a freshman. I don't care. That's too scary. But writing a cover letter in English class, oh, I, maybe I can do that. Right? Talking about myself, right? So what are the milestones for each year? You know, if one, two, three, four. Only give them what they need to know this, what they need to do this semester, and then save the bit about the jobs for later. We have a status quo bias, right? Human beings just do that. This is why, right, your students sit in the same seats all semester long. Right? Once you've sat there, well, it's my seat. Right? That's just biology. So how can we use that again in choice making? Um, related to that is defaults. So how about this? You've declared psychology as a major. Here are your courses for next semester. You can change them. But you, you took Psych 101, you're automatically enrolled in Psych 102. That's the next course in the sequence. I know that seems obvious to you and me, and it seems like the, the advisor will give them that. But I didn't know that. I literally, I took Chemistry 101. It's like, wait, there's a Chemistry 102? I thought I was done. Oh, I want to be a chemistry, right? I had said chemistry major, and so I didn't know Chemistry 102. I thought organic was next. I, I don't, uh, my roommate said, yeah, right? So, why not give them, a, again, they can change these things, they can change their major, but give them the right default. And do not let them put off statistics until they're a senior, when they're a psych major. Because then it's like, no, I, now I can't be a psych major, I gotta start all over, drop out, right? Make them take statistics early on, and you can do that by having a default. Once you've declared psych, you have to take statistics next semester, right? Or get a waiver or something, or have to go in and you have to, right, when you have to do something, our status quo and default makes us not do it. Um, I'm a big fan of, of opt-in advisor appointments, or, or opt-out. So if you've been to the doctor in the last five years, you know that healthcare knows this, right? You came in for your physical, what do they give you? Or you go to the dentist, here's your next appointment. You can change it. But none of this, call me when you want to come back. No, here's your next appointment. You can change it, right? I've just changed the default. I've, I've made you have to call and do something to change your appointment. So welcome to college. You'll see your advisor on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. We'll send you a reminder the day before. Not everybody's going to show up. But not everybody is showing up with your current method either, right? So give them an appointment. You already know their schedule, right? These are all things that can be automated. Um, measurement, I mentioned this, right? Are you going to study tonight? Are you going to the library tonight? Just asking people that. Putting up a poster that says, are you going to study tonight will increase the amount of st students are studying, right? I mean, the way that you do the sign matters. I was in the bathroom a minute ago and thought the sign that says, you know, by not using paper towels, you're not contributing to landfill, right? So I stopped and didn't take the paper towel because your brain pays more attention to negative messages, but I realized that was, that was a social norm that I believe in. So measurement works. But implementation works even better. Asking students how they will study, when will they get their shot, when will they show up for counseling, make an appointment, and then you can change it later. They're much, more, again, eight or nine times more likely to show up. Social norms. It turns out that in voting, if you tell people, right, um, 11 million people didn't vote in the last you know, election, people vote less. If I say, voter turnout is going to be high tomorrow, I increase voter turnout. The library is going to be packed tonight. Get there early for a seat. 
It works, right? So everyone is studying for bio tonight, right? You know, having, so having your RAs know when there's a big bio test that all the freshmen in the dorm are in, and so everybody's, right? That's, that actually will increase more studying. Emotional nudges. I know this one's silly, but anybody, anybody ever been on Duolingo? Right, or learned a foreign language. Oh my God, you're on a streak. I have a friend who's on a 550 day streak. And he's like, no, no, I, got, I, gotta, go, I, gotta, I gotta keep my streak going. It's like, what? It's an app, it's not a person. <laughs> I wanna lose my streak. You've gone to class five days in a row. Yes, you get 10 cents off a of coffee. <laughs> keep going, right? That's, look, video games do this because it works. Starbucks does it because it works. So let's join the club, right? Marketers have known this for a long time. So little emotional nudges, little rewards. And again, the reward could be a smiley face, right? Or it could be, right, you know, a gift card for a coffee or something in the bookstore or something like that. Or just recognition, right? We're always talking about recognition on our campus. Recognition. You've gone to class for three weeks. You haven't missed a class. I noticed. Now, we could ask our faculty to do this, or we could just automate it. But these are things that work. Um, gold graded, I mentioned. Um, and finally, loss aversion. This is really interesting. So it turns out human beings value something they're going to lose twice over something they're going to gain. So if I want you to quit smoking and I say, I'll give you $100 for if you quit smoking, that actually gets some people to quit smoking. As little as $100, that's a threshold barrier because you wanted to quit smoking. You just needed a little bit of incentive, right? But if I say to you, you give me $100, I'll give it back to you when you quit smoking. It works twice as well. So this is called loss aversion, right? That, that people are more sensitive to loss than to gain. And think about this. If, if there's an opportunity appears in the jungle and you don't take it, eh, you don't die. You don't pay attention to like, oh my God, I could lose my leg. Jump, right? It's a bad thing. So, so we, our brains are set up to pay more attention to the negative. So rebates. I think, are, I think are very promising. Tuition rebates, right? And um, there's a lot of evidence that financial incentives do have some effect. They mostly work for, for, for women and girls, right? Get better grades, get more money. Here's a merit scholarship based upon keeping your A. Turns out that the worse you did in high school, the more sensitive you are to it, right? So if you were an A student in, in high school and I offer you gr money for grades, actually has a negative effect. Same is true for blood donors. And this is because there's this social, right? If you're giving blood because you think it's a good thing to do, and then I come along and say, hey, I'll give you $100 for your blood. Well, you've put a value on it. I'm less likely to give blood. But the people who are not giving blood are now more likely. So, so segmenting actually matters here. So for your worst students, <clears throat> right, the students who are getting the Ds and Fs, the students who didn't do well in high school, for every grade you get, you get $50 back. And it's the same thing, right? You're giving them a financial incentive. You get $50 of your own money back um, I also think this will work for grades, right? So in my class, everybody gets an A. I'm giving you an A. Everybody starts with an A. You have an A. It's yours to lose. So I'm going to subtract points when you don't work hard enough, and, right? That's actually more of an incentive than starting at zero and having to gain points. You have an A right now. You're going to, if you don't do well in the midterm, you will lose some points and you get close to a B. And right, that, that actually has, so this is about motivation, getting you to do more push-ups. So the, the nuggets, so nudge self-perceptions uh, perceptions and self-beliefs. If I can get you to change the way you look at the world, change is what matters. Get, so if I can get you to rethink this, again, people don't go to the gym because they don't have the right clothes. They don't see themselves as exercise people, right? So calling students scholars, right? Those kinds of, you know, self-belief really does, does matter. But threshold habits are also the key, right? So nudging habits and behaviors, not outcomes, right? So instead of giving you money for your grades, so there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting meta study, because lots of school districts do this, right? They give you money for grades. <clears throat> but the ones, that doesn't work that well. It works a little bit. What works much better, <clears throat> I'm going to give you money every time you read a book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the, your parents $20 every time you complete more math problems. That really works. Those students do better, they get better grades because I change their behavior, right? So if I'm trying to get you to do more work, everything matters, right? All the little things on your campus, the lighting, the, the hours of the library, it's all sending messages to students. So our job is to think about what we can design and integrate and connect, motivate, consolidate on our campuses because you've got all of these things, especially if you're residential. 
right? Even if you're not, you still have the commuter students. You want to keep them on campus for as long as possible. But if you're a residential campus, you have all this other stuff to integrate. If you have athletics, how can I integrate those things? So this is the trial I'm currently working on, so I don't have the results yet. But <clears throat> students fill out a weekly study survey. And if you're interested in joining this, you know, let me know. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking for different types of campuses because I want to try it. You know, I'm going to try one you know, middle school, uh, you know, commuter school, and residential, et cetera. How many hours did you study? Um, uh, what courses did you study, right, et cetera? And then you get one text a week, probably Sunday night, says, hey, you're studying less than the average student, right? You're studying three hours a week less than the A students, right? Because I, I, don't want, I, don't, I, want, I want 90% of people to get the message. And then here's what you can do, right? And of course, if you're an A student, you're gonna get a smiley face, right? Because I know that works for, and you know in the energy study, you know what's interesting? When they stopped sending these messages to consumers of electricity after a year, guess what happened? Nothing. They kept doing it. This is the holy grail of nudges, right? Persistence. Once I stop sending you reminders, you still do your dishes by hand. I stop sending you reminders and you're still studying. So personalized action steps. So one of those is one of the, one of the, control, one of the groups is make a plan. For, how you will for when you will study and where you will study this week. I know that's going to have a ninefold increase on in one whether you study. Right? So this doesn't cost any money. Right? Um, so we're still in the experimental stage of this. Um, so the last thing is nudging with space. Now, you can't do this all the time, but it's fun, so I'm going to show you. Uh, because right, our, our spaces are full of opportunities. So here's one. This is a bathroom at the University of Nebraska. Right? What does it tell you? What is it telling you to do? Right? It's telling you not to do graffiti. Leave a post-it note. Is it perfect? No. But right, it is sending a message. It didn't cost much, and it sends a message. So spaces are invitations. So the biggest one is our dorms. right? So when we designed new dorms, um, we, did, we looked at data. You've got 100 vendors out there looking at data. So the data that matters, right? so obviously lighting. I already talked about turning the lighting down. At, at automatically every night, taking the blue light out, changing the, the, the color of the light at night. <clears throat> but we also know that the data is which, which freshman rooms are best, singles, doubles, triples, or quads? Which rooms have the lowest graduation rate? If you're a freshman living in one of those rooms, which is the worst place to be? Yes, because relationships matter. A single is the loneliest place on campus. What's next worse? Nobody here had two siblings. Triples! It's two against one. Yeah, now, now, by the way, the two against one thing, that's a theory. I don't have any evidence for that. The, the data is that triples are the next worse. My rationalization is that, well, you know, if you've got two siblings, you know it's always two against one. Quads actually end up being the best. Three times the chances to make a friend. You don't have to be friends with all your roommates. You just need one friend. So doubles, doubles are almost as good, but quads are the best. But students don't like quads, so we built doubles, because doubles are almost as good as quads. But it also turns out, the further you are from the bathroom as a freshman, the more likely you are to retain as a student. Isn't data analysis wonderful? Now, again, I don't have an explanation except the one I'm about to make up, which is that if you're next to the bathroom, you meet exactly nobody when you go to the bathroom. You go back and forth to your room. If you're in your single and you go to the bathroom, it's like you don't have any friends because you're going back and forth to the bathroom. You're at the end of the hall. you got to wander down the hall in a towel twice a day. Hey, how are you? i got to go pee. I'll be back. Oh, you're playing cards. That's cool. Hey, how are you? Right? I mean, you're, you're just going to see more people. So these dorms have much bigger lounges and smaller rooms. The bathrooms are centralized, not convenient. The bathrooms are next to the lounges. The laundry rooms are upstairs. Not in the basement, because I want you to do laundry. But mostly, I want, you to, I want you to see people doing laundry and think, oh, there's a kitchen on every floor. And the staircases are designed so that you have to walk through the lounge. So you come up the staircase, you have to walk through the lounge to get to the next staircase. And then you go up the staircase, and there's another lounge. You got to go through four lounges. See, so grades were actually better at the top floor than the bottom. It's like, what? We just, we just, you, you make more friends. You're more likely to see people go into class at the end of the hallway, right? They have that backpack you're wearing. Why is that? Class? We're supposed to go to, I thought this was just camp. We have class, right? I'll go to class too, right? I mean, that, that sense of, of seeing other people do stuff. 
But so I made the rooms actually smaller and the lounges bigger. Put a put a, a kitchen on every floor. There's actually a demonstration kitchen over here, um, where with a camera, like it's a, one of those Food Channel things, and the moms come in and they make dinner. It's like crazy. It worked. Um, but my best idea of all time, I made the Wi-Fi faster in the lounges <laughs> and slower in the rooms. So you can still stream a video in your room, but it's hard. If you really want to watch, you need to go. And so also there's giant screens at the end of, in, the, in the lounge where you, people play video games with other people. And I, and I made the rooms narrower so that you, because you, the students were bringing those eight-foot screens, it's like, well, you can't get back far enough because the rooms are too narrow. So they're longer and skinnier. Um, this raised the GPA from 3.0 to 3.3 for freshmen, right? Changes in the design of the dorm. Um, we put exercise, of course. It's, notice the glass. It's downstairs. You, can, you, you can see other people sweating and what they're wearing. Maybe you could join them. And then the dining hall, right? We, you all know that the problem we have, the, those of you who have dining halls, <coughs> students want more choices. That's fine. <coughs> but students today, for the first time in history, come to college with all of their high school friends with them on their phone. So where do they want to eat? In their room on Facebook talking to their high school friends. And we want them to make new, uncomfortable friends on our campus. That's uncomfortable. Why would I do that? So we had a couple of problems. The first is that students were, eat, were taking food out of the dorm and going back to the, right there. They're taking food out of the cafeteria. And so I changed the rules. I said, you can only take food out twice a week. You have to eat in the cafeteria. So I made the Wi-Fi faster in the cafeteria, like way faster. Students protested. And we served 50% more meals. 50% more meals were eaten in the dorm, partly because I, I prevented them, right? I just said, you can only take food out twice a week. And yes, if you have a class, I mean, there are, some, there are some cases, but they all want grab and go, right? Many of you have an app. How many of you have an app for food on your campus or even know about this, right? Which means you can sit in your bio class, you can order your burger and your chips, and you can, it's ready for you, just like a drive through and you only you walk through and you pick up your burger, and then you go back to your room and you get on Facebook. You don't have to go in the dorm. Well, well, that's convenient, and the students like it, but it's not what's good for them. And sometimes our job is to nudge them for what's good for them and not what they want. This station is also right, designed to be slow, right? The students like stir fry, and they like it to be made in front of them. But what happens when food is made in front of you? You have to stand there and talk to somebody because you're waiting for your food. So you get to have fresh food prepared here. The food is here on the right. Um, so this is the most popular station because it's fresh, it's good, but it's also the place where people have the most conversations, right? Because they're standing there waiting for their food. So these changes increased the number of students eating in the dining hall. Again, faster, faster, faster Wi-Fi here. So new technology means that thinking just got more important. Yay, us. We teach thinking, not just content. Um, but it also means that course design got more important. But it also means that integration, right? The, 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 it's not just what we do individually, but how we can get our campuses to connect. So a lot of what our jobs are to help retention, I talked about a lot of nudges and little things we can do here and there, but a lot of this is integration and connecting the pieces. If we can help students see that the value of this relates to that, they will be more engaged. And they don't recognize that the things they're learning in athletics or the things they're learning in student government or the things they're learning in conflict resolution in their dorm relate to what they're learning in class. And so the more integration we do, the better our students will do. But it's also the places our, our institutions are going to stay in business. Because if all you do is sell content, Stanford and Harvard are going to beat you with that because they're giving it away for free on their phone. Right? So if all, you, all we do is sell content, we're, we're, we're doomed. So I think that the, 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 the future for us belongs in embracing change. We are helping students learn to change, making ourselves obsolete so they will be able to change for themselves. And so giving them practice at changing is critical. And for that, I hope we can integrate and help them do that. What you do is really hard. What the charge I've just given you is impossibly hard. It also really, really matters. It matters for our students, and frankly, that matters for our country. Right? The ability to change your mind is probably the singest, biggest problem we have in politics today in our public life. Right? We need students to see people like you go, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. You may have changed my mind. That is the way we empower students to be able to make changes themselves. They see all of us and all of you as role models.
be a role model, model how to change your mind. Relationships really do matter, and I know that you do that and care every day. So for that really hard work, I thank you and I honor you. Thank you.